they said. 
brother leaving with the girl who was supposed to be his girlfriend and realised he would have another lonely walk home. As he reached the top of Black Hill, he was worried once more about some altercation with Greg and his brothers, but thankfully no one appeared. He was still cautious as he walked down the hill and turned the corner, but when he came out of the alleyway and realised he was free, he felt an enormous lightning of worry. As he walked past the lawn that he fell onto yesterday, however, he realised he was being watched. The door of the old woman's house was open once more, and there she stood, curly grey hair, round glasses, and walking stick. In hand. She smiled at Jim, but he couldn't quite work out whether it was a friendly smile or not. He decided to walk by. You're welcome, she said, which Jim thought was a, a funny thing to say. Then he remembered that she had said the exact same thing the day before. In a moment of curiosity, he decided to respond. What for? he said, turning around. Those boys, they've stopped bothering you, haven't they? Uh, yeah, they have. Jim replied. Well, said the old woman, you're welcome. I don't understand. Why am I welcome? Because I stop them from bothering you. And normally when someone does something nice for you, you say thank you. Uh, said Jim. His mind now starting to consider the possibility that the rumours about this old woman being mad were true. Well, thank you. You're very welcome, my darling. Would you like to come in for a cup of tea now? While Jim could just about stomach having a conversation with the old woman on her front lawn, where they were in clear view. The thought of entering her house was a different story altogether. Ah, uh, no, sorry, that's very kind of you, said Jim, doing his absolute best to be polite. But I really must be getting home. My mother is expecting me. Suit yourself, said the old woman, giving another smile. Then she turned around and shut the door without saying goodbye. Odd, thought Jim, but he did not stop to contemplate the situation as he heard the recognisable sound of Greg and his brothers chatting as they came down Black Hill. He decided to make a swift departure back home. The next day was Friday and it started in much the same way as the one before. Jim realised there was some comfort in routine. What lessons have we got today, said Tom, who was also in the same form as Jim 
French, science, PE, and art, Jim replied. Ah, oh, yes, I love PE, said Tom. But Jim did not love PE. He didn't mind other subjects science, English, maths, if it wasn't for the scary teacher. Because he knew if he concentrated, he could quietly get a good grade. But P.E. was different. He was never that good at sports, particularly team sports. He worried about the possibility of being shoved around. And he worried about making a mistake and letting everyone else down. He also worried about getting changed in the changing rooms. He would have to take his clothes off and there would be no teacher there. Someone might steal his things or push him in the showers. A whole range of things could go wrong. P.E. came, lesson three, just before lunch. Boys and girls had to stand in separate queues outside the P.E. block before going inside to get changed. This made Jim even more nervous. Obviously, he didn't want to get changed in front of the girls, but they always seemed so much nicer, calmer, more sensible, that they often prevented a lot of the boys' silliness. The PE teacher came out and stood in front of the two queues. Right, he said. You're going in the left or boys, you're going in the right. You've got five minutes to get changed and then meet in the sports hall. He had a big smile on his face, but there was something about it that didn't seem friendly, like he somehow knew Jim was worried and he was smiling about that. The boys went into the changing rooms and each rushed to find a corner to change. All were quiet as they took off their school uniforms and put on their new PE kits as quickly as possible. Nobody wanted to be the last one out. Jim could feel the panic rising in him when he realised he was one of four boys left. He was struggling to pull his long yellow socks up and panicking didn't help. One by one, the remaining boys left and it was just him. Finally, the socks were on. He slipped on his trainers, tied them up, and ran to the sports hall. As he entered, the rest of the class and the teacher stood watching silently. Jim, embarrassed, joined the back of the pack. The lesson itself was fine. They had to do something called a bleep test, which meant 
was a lot fitter than Jim, made it to level 11, the second best in the group. Problems began back in the changing rooms. Jim had just started to get changed when a hand reached round and grabbed his school shirt from off the bench. He turned around. It was Greg. Jim just looked at him. He wanted to say, give it back Greg, or something similar. But the words just wouldn't come. For some reason, Jim felt a lot more scared of Greg now than when they were in primary school. It was Tom that intervened. Come on, Greg. Give him his shirt back. Greg had a big smile on his face. I just thought it looked a little dirty. That's all, he said. Thought I might give it a wash. And on the word wash, Greg held his shirt under a shower that was running behind him. He laughed moronically and then threw it back at Jim. It thudded, sodden against his chest and then landed with a splat on the floor. Great, thought Jim. And that was the rest of the day. Sitting in a wet shirt throughout lunch and period four, covering it up with his school jumper. When the bell went for home time, Jim made another speedy getaway, not even bothering to see if his brother was walking the same way too. When he got to the top of Black Hill, he looked around and saw that Greg was nowhere in sight, so he descended quickly. Hopefully, he thought, if I leave at this time every day, I can avoid him altogether. But Jim was wrong, for as he turned the corner, there stood Greg, his older brother and his older brother's friend, who just happened to be putting out a cigarette as Jim appeared.
as he stepped out of the alleyway, he saw the boys waiting. His bag, it seemed, had been thrown onto the old woman's front lawn. Jim moved to pick it up, and as he did so, Greg jumped on him and pushed him to the ground. Get him, Greg, the other two boys yelled. Jim rolled over and looked up to see Greg's raised fist above his head. Any moment, it would smash down onto his face. Jim was terrified. Then, strangely, there seemed to be a change in atmosphere. Leave him, Greg. He's not worth it, said Greg's brother. And Greg, lowering his fist, seemed to agree with him. He stood up, and the three boys walked off, laughing as they did so. Jim lay there, stunned. A moment later, the front door of the old woman's house opened. Like before, she appeared in the doorway. You're welcome, she said. Uh, thank you, said Jim. And this time, he felt like he meant it. Perhaps you should come in for that cup of tea now. Jim, still in disbelief as to what had just happened, agreed. Okay, he said, and he stood up and walked into the house. It began with a narrow hallway. The old woman showed him into the living room which was very much how you would expect an old person's house to look. The furniture seemed old-fashioned, though clean, and there were comfortable sitting chairs all around. In the middle, resting on a table, was a pot of tea and two cups, as if she had been expecting Jim to call. He was struck by the sweet, relaxing smell that seemed to flood the air. Several bouquets of flowers, Jim realised, decorated the room. Take a seat, the old woman said. Jim sat down, still in a bit of a daze. The old woman sat opposite him, smiled, picked up the teapot, and began to pour. Neither of them spoke, and the only sound was the tea tinkling into the cup, and Jim's heavy breathing. Do you take sugar? the old woman asked. No, thank you, said Jim. Having poured the milk, the old woman handed Jim the cup, saying, There you are. Jim thanked her, and then stared into the cup, a bit uncertain what to do with it. This happened to be Jim's first ever cup of tea. He held it tentatively with the tips of his fingers, waiting for the moment when he thought it would be cool enough to drink. The old woman sat down in the chair opposite him, her short legs barely touching the floor. She stared at him for a moment, smiling. Are you all right now, Jim? she asked. Yes, much better, thank you, Jim said, trying to sound confident. He couldn't remember whether he had told her his name 
My name is Mrs. Florence, she said. It's nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you too, said Jim in reply. Then neither of them spoke. Jim had questions, but didn't feel brave enough to ask. He wasn't sure whether it would be rude for him to speak first, or whether he should, as he had been told so many times when he was younger. Wait until he was spoken to. He looked around the room. There were paintings hung on the walls of various coastal scenes, fishing villages, cliffs, ships at sea. There were sculptures too. A man sitting cross-legged, a crucifix, and other symbols and images that Jim didn't recognize. The most significant features of the room, however, were the glorious bunches of flowers that seemed to fill every space. Beautiful colours emanated from the petals of flowers of such a range of shapes and sizes, none of which Jim knew the names of. You're frightened, aren't you, Jim? There was something about the way she looked at him which made him feel as if she was looking right inside of him. Again, Jim wasn't sure what the correct way to respond was. He didn't want to seem impolite by saying that he was frightened because then maybe Mrs. Florence would assume that he was frightened of her. Yes, I am a bit, he replied, deciding to plump for honesty. He felt himself beginning to relax and took his first sip of tea. Mrs. Florence watched him and smiled at him as she did so. He decided to brave a question. Did you stop those boys from beating me up? In a way, Mrs. Florence replied. How? I asked. Jim thought about this for a moment. He couldn't remember hearing her voice as he stared up at Greg's fist. Jim didn't want to seem rude, but he was curious and so went a bit further. I didn't hear you ask them, he said. A big smile showing all of Mrs. Florence's teeth broke out across her face like the sun dawning on a new day. Oh, my darling, she said, her Cornish accent becoming thicker. I didn't ask them. That would have been pointless. I asked the universe. Jim looked puzzled. The universe gives me everything I ask for, she said simply. Jim frowned. It does, he said, feeling dizzy with scepticism and confusion. He suddenly realised he was drinking tea in a strange house with a mad woman. It does, she said, and smiled again. But how? Because I believe that it will. Right. Well, thanks very much for the tea, said Jim, hurrying to get out of this crazy person's house. You don't believe me, do you? Mrs. Florence said as Jim got up to leave. Uh, once again, Jim felt honesty was best. Not really, no. That's okay. Not many people do. That's why 
for something. 
of his mouth made him look a little bit like a circus clown. He finished brushing his teeth and cleaned his face. Oh well, he thought, maybe the universe just needs a bit of time. Most of the rest of the weekend was quite fun. Jim went to see Tom on Saturday afternoon and they played computer games. Then, in the evening, it was one of those rare occasions in Jim's house where the family would sit round for dinner and mum and dad wouldn't argue. They ate a Chinese takeaway. Jim loved Kang Po chicken and then watched some Saturday night TV. Most of Sunday was good too. Mum made a roast for lunch, which was delicious. By the afternoon, however, Jim realised that he had better do the homework that had been set the week before. He began to wonder if every Sunday afternoon would be cursed with preparing for the week ahead in this way. Sunday evening came. Jim began to feel the dread of going back to school bubble in his stomach. Would it be this way before every Monday morning? He thought. He looked out of his window at bedtime and stared down at the drive. Still the universe had not supplied him with a sports car. He had a dwindling hope that it might appear Monday morning, but in reality, Jim was beginning to feel like it was never going to happen. A stupid idea, inspired by a crazy old woman. Simple as that. Jim went to bed feeling foolish, disappointed, and anxious about school the next day. Monday morning came, still no sports car. Of course, thought Jim, it was all so ridiculous. He couldn't believe that he had tried it in the first place. He got to school early as usual, the playground empty as usual. The faint excitement at doing something new that existed on the faces of the other year seven boys last week was starting to fade. It was slowly becoming obvious that they would have another five years of this. Jim had Math's first lesson and was devastated when Mrs. Numbers, a funny name for a maths teacher, asked everyone to get their homework out and he couldn't find it in his bag. That's going to have to be a detention, Jim, she said. I'm disappointed. This isn't a good start at all. Jim couldn't believe it. He had sat and done his maths homework yesterday afternoon and he was sure he'd put it in his bag. He thought he could probably tell her what the answers to the questions were if she would ask, but she wouldn't. She was a stern, fierce woman, and it was clear her decision was final. The detention was after school that day. Mrs Numbers had spoken to his mum. She had said, and he would have to stay until four o'clock to complete the work. Jim felt some satisfaction when he was able
trousers as usual, and she was leaning on her walking stick. Jim thought about turning back, but it was too late. She had already seen him. He smiled at her, but carried on walking. As he passed her front door, he could feel her eyes looking at him. He had just gone by her when she said, You asked for something, didn't you, my darling? Jim stopped. He slowly turned and looked up at her. He debated telling her the truth, but then decided not to. He didn't want her to think that he had fallen for her stupid stories. No, he said, as firmly as possible, but then looked down, feeling the weight of the lie in his stomach. Yes, you did. What did you ask for? Jim decided to give in. A sports car, he said hopelessly, full of embarrassment. A sports car, Mrs. Florence said, a big smile coming across her face. Now, what on earth would you want one of those for? I don't know, just thought it would be cool, said Jim, shrugging his shoulders. He felt she was making fun of him, as if he was foolish for falling for her lies, and foolish for asking for such a foolish thing. But Mrs. Florence's reaction surprised him. Yes, I guess it would be cool, she said, nodding. Did the universe supply? No, he said. No, it didn't. Ah, well, would you like to come in for a cup of tea? No, thanks, Jim said. I need to get home. Okay, then. Bye, Mrs. Florence said, smiling, and shut the door. Stupid woman with her stupid stories, grumbled Jim to himself as he walked home. Made a right fool out of me. I bet she's having a right laugh in her stupid house now. Jim continued to be in a bad mood when he got home, and Mum told him off for getting a detention. But Mum, he said in protest, I did the homework. I did it yesterday afternoon. You saw me doing it. Mum, however, was having none of it. She was more interested in taking the adult side than listening to what Jim had to say. Jim stomped upstairs and went to his bedroom. There, underneath his desk, having fallen out of his bag that morning, was his maths homework. Ah! shouted Jim, picking up the work, screwing it up and throwing it in the bin. The next day, he was careful to pack his bag with all of his homework, and Jim made it through all of his lessons without receiving any detentions. His brother was still walking home with his new girlfriend. It seemed they had become quite the item, and despite the desire to take a different route home, Jim opted for ease and decided to go down Black Hill as usual. He spied Greg and his friends some distance in front of him and decided to hang back until he was sure he would not cross their path. When he got to the top of Black Hill, he looked down and guessed that they must have turned the corner for he could not see them. Had they exited the alley, or were they lurking just out of sight, aware that Jim was close behind them? He crept down the hill slowly, listening intently 
any noise that might be made. When he made it to the bottom, he heard Greg say, Wow! Look at that! Jim could tell that they had left the alleyway, and so he crept around the corner and hid just out of sight behind some bushes. He could see Greg, his brother, and his brother's friend looking at something in wonder, but he couldn't see what the object was. That is awesome, said Greg's brother. Yeah, wicked, said his friend. I bet it goes well quick. Yeah, said Greg. The three boys spent a long time admiring the unknown object, and Jim began to wonder whether he would be better off going back up Black Hill and taking the longer route home. Eventually, however, Greg's brother said they had better get going, and off they went. Slowly, Jim emerged from the alleyway, and as he did so, his heart jumped into his mouth. Sitting in front of Mrs. Florence's house, next to her front lawn, was a bright orange convertible sports car. Jim couldn't believe it. He stared and stared. He couldn't find the words to speak. A sports car. Jim had to find out what it was doing there. For the first time, he walked straight up to Mrs. Florence's house and knocked. He could hear someone shuffling along the hallway behind the front door. He heard clicking as locks were undone. Jim couldn't contain himself. Please hurry up and open the door, he thought. And then she did. Oh, hello, Jim. How nice to see you, Mrs. Florence said, a big smile forming across her face. How are you? Yeah, I'm fine, said Jim, perhaps a little impolitely. But he was too keen to move on to the subject that occupied his mind. Is that your sports car? Oh, that, said Mrs. Florence, feigning little interest. Yes, it is. But how did, what the, why? Jim was struck for words. Mrs. Florence, who was only a little bit taller than Jim, and would no doubt be a lot shorter by the time he reached 16, leaned forward, looked Jim right in the eye, and said, I asked Jim. She turned around and walked into the living room, leaving the front door open. Jim saw it as an invitation to follow, which he duly did. But how come you get the sports car and I don't, he said, desperate to know the secret. I've missed a bait. Hang on. Right. Mrs. Florence looked up slowly. Have you closed the door? Jim shook himself, as if he had just remembered his manners. Oh no, sorry, he said, and rushed back to close it. He carefully took his shoes off. 
best thing to do was to sit in silence and blow on his tea. Mrs. Florence stirred her tea and then sat back in her chair. So, said Mrs. Florence, what do you want to know? Well, it's just, I ask for a sports car and wait all weekend and don't get one. But you ask and get one straight away. How come? What did I do wrong? Mrs. Florence smiled. Well, she said, how did you ask? Jim thought about it. I was in the bathroom, brushing my teeth. And I said, dear universe, please can I have a sports car? Or something like that. Okay, then what did you do? I didn't really do anything. Looked out the window and got on with the rest of my weekend. Mrs. Florence nodded and looked straight at him. You're a nice boy, Jim. The universe wants to work for you as it wants to work for everyone. But you have to know how to do things properly. She paused and looked at him. But no, I don't think you really want to know this. Not really. Yes, said Jim, I do, please. No, said Mrs. Florence teasingly. I don't think you're ready. I am Mrs. Florence, I promise. And he tried his best to give his most convincing smile. Okay, but pay attention. Jim nodded. First of all, when you ask the universe for something, don't do it while brushing your teeth. If you want whatever it is you're asking for, then you need to give it the proper time to ask for it. Don't do it while you're doing something else. Okay, said Jim. He wasn't sure whether he was being told off or not, but there was a warmth to Mrs. Florence's eyes that assured him all was well. Secondly, she said, you have to change the way you ask. Don't actually ask. Try to make it more of a demand. Something like, Dear Universe, bring me a sports car. I give thanks that it appears now. There needs to be more confidence than just asking. Or you can be even more arrogant. Something like, Dear Universe, I am the owner of a sports car. I give thanks that it appears now in the best way. Do you understand? Yeah, right, think so, said Jim, a bit puzzled. Making a demand like that seemed a little bit rude to Jim, but he wasn't about to question the old woman. After all, she was the one with the sports car on her drive, not him. Finally, said Mrs. Florence, and she opened her hands to show how important her statement was. And this is the really important bit. You have to believe that it's going to happen. And not just that. You have to show the universe that you believe it is going to happen. So after I asked for an orange sports car, I did a few things. First of all, I went outside and I cleared my drive so that there was a space to put the car. Jim thought about it. The drive had been full of plant pots and various other things yesterday. 
as Jim left the house, he stared at the bright orange sports car for a while, and a short laugh of glee escaped him. It was an amazing sight, a miracle. So excited was he that he largely ran the whole way home, and he felt as if the whole world was on his side. The birds singing in the trees, the horses in the field, everything was working with him. It was a feeling he'd never had before. When he got home, he greeted his mum with a big kiss on the cheek, which came as something of a surprise, but a big smile came across her face and a little of Jim's happiness spread from him to her. What time is tea, ma'am? he asked, taking off his shoes in the hallway. About six o'clock, she called from the kitchen. Great, thanks ma'am, he said, rushing upstairs to his bedroom. Jim threw his bag on the bedroom floor, shut his door, and sat on his bed. Then, he wondered what to ask for. I could ask for a million pounds, maybe, but how do I show active faith that I'm going to receive the money, he thought. That one seemed a bit trickier somehow. He could ask for a pet dog. He'd always wanted one, but Mum and Dad had always said they didn't have enough room. That one seemed a bit tricky, too. Yes, he could ask for one, and the universe would provide him with one. But when, where would they put it? Would the dog just become very sad, with only a small garden to run around? Jim wouldn't want that to happen. So, what could he ask for? Maybe he could try the sports car again, and just do the exact same things that Mrs. Florence did. But then he realised that the drive of his house was already clear and he had no bus pass to tear up. Jim went to bed strangely disappointed that night. The happy glow inside of him had disappeared. He had left Mrs Florence with so much hope that he could have anything he wanted. But now that he was at home, he couldn't figure out how to get any of it. Every time he thought of something, he came up with some reason not to ask for it. Little doubts and fears seemed to creep into his mind. He decided to go to speak with Mrs. Florence again the next day and ask for her advice.